This is going to be an overview of the book of Zechariah. Zechariah's name means Jehovah Remembers. This book has 14 chapters, 211 verses, and around 6,444 words. The historical time would be around 520 B.C. to 487 B.C. And remember, you have three applications. In the Bible, when you approach the Bible, remember you have three applications. Historically, what you have is Zechariah encourages the people to keep building the temple. This takes place after the 70-year captivity. So they would call it a post-exilic. They would say it's post-exilic because it takes place after the captivity. Uh, Doctrinally, you're going to see things about the second coming. The Lord himself will return to dwell in the newly built temple in Jerusalem. So you're going to see some things about the millennium. Some things about the tribulation. Inspirational. When we look at it, what can we get for us today? We need to never stop building, and the Lord's going to keep working on us. So Zechariah is a very fun and exciting book, especially if you like the deep and secret things. And it gives you a lot of the feeling of, what did I just read? That will pop in your mind a lot when you read this. Zechariah 4.13 really sums up a lot of people's feelings about the book because it says, when Zechariah is talking to the angel, It says, And he answered me and said, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. You see, that that really sums up a lot of what people feel about the book because sometimes you're reading Zechariah and you're like, I don't know what I just read at all. But Zechariah has ten visions in one night. And in chapter one, he has a vision about four horses under the myrtle trees. Four horns, four smiths, And you also see he gives some prophecies about Jerusalem at the end of the church age. So in chapter 1, Zechariah starts out telling them to turn to the Lord. He says in Zechariah 1.3, Therefore say thou unto them, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Turn ye unto me, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will turn unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. No matter your situation, the best thing you can do right now is turn to the Lord. If you're not saved... Then turn to the Lord and believe on Jesus Christ who shed his blood. He died for your sins. He was buried and resurrected. If you're already saved, then the best thing to do is make sure you're right with the Lord. Are you living for him? If not, the best thing for you to do is turn to the Lord. And the Bible is written in such a way that any man from any age can pick it up and learn how to get right with God. If you don't know anything about the Bible, if you don't even know half of what I've just said already, You can understand this, that is, turn to the Lord the best way you know how. Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins. He was buried and resurrected. All you have to do to be saved is come to Him as a guilty sinner that you are and believe on Jesus Christ. And if you are saved, all you got to do is come to Him right now and tell Him, I've not been as close to you as I should and I want to start living for you. That's all you got to do. And then you can start your journey of getting close to God and learning the Bible. Zechariah 1.4 Be ye not as your fathers, unto whom the former prophets have cried, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Turn ye now from your evil ways and from your evil doings. But they did not hear, nor hearken unto me, saith the Lord. The problem was that the Jews didn't pass along the words of God to their children, and their children ended up in sin as well. So he says, Be ye not as your fathers. The majority of people today have parents who never turn to the Lord. Their parents never listened to the preacher. Their parents never read the Bible. Their parents never told them how to be saved. So Zechariah says, Be ye not as your fathers. If your father was wicked, you don't have to be like him. You don't have to be wicked. In chapter 2, Zechariah has another vision, and he sees a man with a measuring line. He also gives prophecies concerning Jerusalem at the second coming of Jesus Christ. And he says in Zechariah 2, 6, Ho, ho, come forth and flee from the land of the north, saith the Lord. For I have spread you abroad as the four winds of the heaven, saith the Lord. So Santa Claus is in your Bible. Look, it said, Ho, ho, flee from the land of the north. Okay, just kidding. That's not really Santa Claus. However, there are so many things about Santa that come from the Bible that it is beyond coincidence. And I'm not saying parents are wicked for telling their kids about Santa Claus, but he is a counterfeit. 
In Zechariah 2.11, it says, And many nations shall be joined to the Lord in that day, and shall be my people, and I will dwell in the midst of thee, and thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts has sent me unto thee. Notice that phrase, in that day. That's the day of the Lord. When Jesus Christ comes back at the second coming to set up his kingdom, many nations shall be joined to the Lord. That definitely isn't today. America is supposed to be the most Christian nation, and we're not joined to the Lord. The majority of people in this country don't even care about the Bible. Many of them hate the Bible. Zechariah 12 and 2, 12 and 13. And the Lord shall inherit Judah, the portion in the Holy Land, and shall choose Jerusalem again. He's going to choose Jerusalem again. But many people think that God is done with them. He says, Be silent, O all flesh, before the Lord, for he is raised up out of his holy habitation. Can you imagine Jesus Christ coming back down out of his holy habitation? You will be able to physically see him in the millennial kingdom. In chapter 3, Zechariah sees Joshua the high priest and Satan trying to resist him. And he talks about the imputed righteousness of the nation of Israel and the branch, the branch that it's talking about. That's Jesus Christ. In Zechariah 3, 1 and 2, it says, And he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuked thee, O Satan, even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? So notice that the devil wants to resist you, but God tells you to resist him. And James 4, 7, Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Notice that he says, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan. And that's exactly what Michael says in the book of Jude. Don't try to handle the devil in your own power. Turn him over to the Lord. Now in chapter 4, Zechariah has a vision of a golden lampstand and the two olive trees. And it says, These are the two witnesses, according to the angel. Zechariah 4, 13 and 14. And he answered me and said, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. Then said he, These are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. The two witnesses are Moses and Elijah. And they come back in the tribulation, Revelation chapter 11, and they match these two, the two olive trees in Zechariah chapter 4. Look at Revelation 11, 3 and 4. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. In chapter 5, Zechariah sees a female unclean spirit. And this is devilish activity that will be present in the tribulation. In one of the unidentified flying objects in the scripture. In Zechariah 5, 5 through 9, you'll see this is a female unclean spirit with wings. And it, Zechariah records that it's wickedness. So I'm showing you that's a female unclean spirit with wings. One of the winged creatures in the scriptures. In chapter 6, Zechariah has a vision of four chariots. And these chariots have red, black, white, grizzled, and bay horses. So what are these? Well, it says in Zechariah 6, 4 and 5, Then I answered and said unto the angel that talked with me, What are these, my Lord? And the angel answered and said unto me, These are the four spirits of the heavens which go forth from standing before the Lord of all the earth. So what are these? That sounds good enough for me, what he said there. In Zechariah six twelve and 13, And speak unto him, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold, the man whose name is the branch. He shall grow up out of his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Even he shall build the temple of the Lord, and he shall bear the glory, and shall sit and rule upon his throne. And he shall be a priest upon his throne, and the council of peace shall be between them both. The Lord himself is obviously the branch. Because look at Jeremiah 23, 5. It says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch. And a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. So the Lord is the branch. And then in chapter 7, you have proper purposes for fasting. In Zechariah 7, 5, it says, Speak unto all the people of the land and to the priests, saying, When ye fasted and mourned in the fifth and seventh month, even these, those seventy years, 
Did ye at all fast unto me, even to me? So what is the motive behind your fasting? The Lord is looking at the motive. Are you fasting for yourself? Or are you doing it for the Lord? In Zechariah 7, 6, when, And when ye did eat, and when ye did drink, did ye not eat for yourselves and drink for yourselves? Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of, the, of God. In chapter 8, you see the restoration of Israel. Zechariah 8, 2, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I was jealous for Zion with great jealousy, and I was jealous for her with great fury. Just like a man should be jealous over his wife, if a man isn't jealous over his wife, then something is wrong. That's why one of my favorite verses is when the Lord tells Abimelech, when he was almost about God with Abraham's wife, he said, Thou art but a dead man. You ought to be jealous over your wife. And when you see verses like that in the Bible, that ought to excite you a little bit. In Zechariah 8, 3, it says, Thus saith the Lord, I am returning to Zion and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, and Jerusalem shall be called a city of truth, and the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. Now to show you that this hasn't already been fulfilled, Jerusalem is going to be a city of truth. It's not a city of truth right now, but it's going to be when the Lord's sitting on the throne. Zechariah 8, 4 and 5, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, There shall yet old... There shall yet old men and old women dwell in the streets of Jerusalem, and every man with his staff in his hand for very age, and the streets of the city shall be full of boys and girls playing in the streets thereof. So the kids will actually be able to play in the streets in the millennium, and not have to worry about pedophiles and sex trafficking. And there will be old men and women. Notice this is not gender neutral in the millennium. In chapter 9, you see the judgment of Israel's enemies. Zechariah 9, 14, And the Lord shall be seen over them, and his arrow shall go forth as the lightning, and the Lord God shall blow the trumpet, and shall go with whirlwinds of the south. The whirlwind in the Bible is associated with his second coming. And what is more intimidating than a hurricane or a tornado? I believe the second coming of the Lord will be the most absolutely terrifying event that's ever taken place in the history of mankind. All of the natural disaster movies rolled into one couldn't compare to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Zechariah 9.15, The Lord of hosts shall defend them, and they shall devour and subdue with sling stones, and they shall drink and make a noise as through wine, and they shall be filled like bowls and as the corners of the altar. So the Lord of hosts shall defend them. He's going to devour and subdue with sling stones. And it says they shall drink and make a noise through wine. And Jesus is going to do that same thing. Psalm 78, 65. Then the Lord awaked as one out of sleep and like a mighty man that shouteth by reason of wine. You know, they're always trying to get Jesus drunk. The country singers, to defend their filthy sin of drinking, they want to get Jesus drunk too. So they say, well, I heard Jesus drank wine. Well, as a, a joke on you, and when he comes back at the second coming, he's coming back shouting like a mighty man, shouting by reason of wine. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God. Then in chapter 10, we see more second coming prophecies and prophecies about the restoration of Israel. In Zechariah 10, 6, it says, And I will strengthen the house of Judah, and I will save the house of Joseph, and I will bring them again to place them, for I have mercy upon them, and they shall be as though I had not cast them off. For I am the Lord their God, and will hear them. How someone could read the Old Testament and believe that God is completely done with Israel is beyond me. They either have to spiritualize the verses or claim that the prophecies about it were fulfilled before the church. In chapter 11, you'll find some prophecies concerning the Antichrist. In Zechariah eleven twelve, And I said unto them, If you think good, give me my price, and if not, forbear. So they weighed for my price 30 pieces of silver. What does that remind you of? It should remind you of Judas Iscariot. He sold out the Lord for 30 pieces of silver, and do you know 
what Jesus calls Jesus, Judas, he calls him the son of perdition in John 17, 12. The Antichrist is called the son of perdition in 2 Thessalonians 2, 3. Zechariah eleven thirteen. And the Lord said unto me, Cast it into the potter, a goodly price that I was prized out of them. And I took the thirty pieces of silver and cast them to the potter in the house of the Lord. You have a prophecy of the betrayal of Jesus Christ for thirty pieces of silver. Then you have the famous verse about the prophecy of the Antichrist in Zechariah eleven seventeen. Woe to the idle shepherd that leaveth the flock. The sword shall be upon his arm and upon his right eye. His arm shall be clean dried up and his right eye shall be utterly darkened. I remember back when I first started doing videos on YouTube and putting Danny Castle sermons up every week. He had the video presentation using this verse that I just read and showing how the Antichrist will have a bad right eye. So all the sellouts today in the occult use the one eye symbolism. And <coughs> you see it everywhere you look. Once you see it, you can't unsee it. Just go to the store, look at the books, look at the young adult books, stuff like that. You'll see the one eye on a good portion of the front of the books. But back then, after after I put that video on, you had all of these conspiracy theory channels using the same verse and making compilation videos about the bad right eye using the Zechariah eleven seventeen. Nobody really used that verse much outside of the Bible believing world until then because nobody reads Zechariah. But after I, I put that Danny Castle video up years ago, people started doing that. And in chapter 12, you'll see the battle of Armageddon. And this is when the Lord comes down in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. In Zechariah 12, 1, the burden of the word of the Lord for Israel, saith the Lord, which stretcheth forth the heavens and layeth the foundation of the earth and formeth the spirit of man within him. The Lord is the one who stretched forth the heavens. He is the one who laid the foundations. 1 Corinthians 10, 26 says, For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. He is the one that formed the spirit in man. He made him out of the dust of the ground. He breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. Zechariah 12, 4, In that day, notice in that day again, saith the Lord, I will smite every horse with astonishment and his rider with madness. And I will open mine eyes upon the house of Judah and will smite every horse of the people with blindness. So, at the second coming, the horses, he's going to smite them all with blindness. And in Psalm 20 and verse 7, it says, Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. All those nations at Armageddon are going to have their trust in themselves, in their artillery, in their horses, in the Antichrist. And the Lord is going to make the horses and he's going to make them blind. And if the blind lead the blind, the law fall into the ditch. They literally have no chance. Not only do they have fire coming at their face, but they're going to be smote with blindness too. Zechariah 12, 9. And it shall come to pass in that day, notice that phrase, that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. The same way he does for individual Christians today, he will do for those Jews. 2 Thessalonians 1 6 says, Seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. Somebody giving you trouble at work, don't try to get vengeance on them. It's a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. And God said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. If you really want to rob God, try to get some of his vengeance. Try to get vengeance on your enemies. That's robbing God because. Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. And it's a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. And he is going to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem, his physical people. That All through the Old Testament, the Jews, the nation of Israel. God doesn't respect persons, but he respects has does have, he doesn't have respect of persons, but he does have respect of nations. All the nations are a drop as of, uh, of a bucket compared to them in the eyes of God. 
You know, people think it's all about America. No, it's not. Zechariah 12, 10, And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. They're going to look on him whom they have pierced. And there's a prophecy about the people at the second coming. And some, the people realizing what... In Psalm twenty two sixteen it says, For dogs have compassed me, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. John nineteen thirty four. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. They pierced him when he came the first time. Revelation 1, 7. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. And they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. So they are going to see that the, one, that the one, their ancestors crucified, was the Lord Jesus. And he's going to be coming back on a white horse. And in chapter 13, you'll find that in the millennium, idolatry and false prophesying will cease. In Zechariah 13, 2, And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, that I will cut off the names of the idols out of the land, and they shall no more be remembered. And I will cause the prophets and the unclean spirit to pass out of the land. In that day, remember, is the day of the Lord, which encompasses, you know, the second coming, the millennium. And at the second coming, the idols will be burned up and won't even come into memory anymore. So the idols you love right now are just temporary. And once I fell in love with the Bible, the temporary idols of the world no longer satisfied. And when we get to the millennium, we will see with our own two eyes the one who... So capital punishment for prophesying in the millennium. This is going to be a time when everyone knows who the Lord is. They're going to know what He wants done. And... What he wants done will be completely out in the open, and nobody's going to have an excuse for going against what he says. It will be plain as day. In Zechariah thirteen four, it says, And it shall come to pass in that day that the prophets shall be ashamed, every one of his vision, when he hath prophesied, neither shall they wear a rough garment to deceive. Zechariah thirteen six, And one shall say unto him, What are these wounds in thine hands? Then he shall answer those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. Remember, he came into his own, and his own received him not. He got wounded in the house of his friends. They put the nails in his hands and his feet. In chapter 14, we have some verses on the millennium. Zechariah 14, 1, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. Remember that the day of the Lord primarily refers to the second coming, but since the day with the Lord is as, as a thousand years, it can also refer to other events as well. And here it refers to the second coming. In Zechariah 14, 2, For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished, and the half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. All the nations will be gathered together against Jesus Christ. Many times enemies will join up one with another to go against a mutual enemy. And that is what they do at the end of the tribulation. They hate Everyone getting together has never been a good thing. You saw it back in Genesis 11 with the Tower of Babel. You see it today in the church where they want everyone to get together despite of damnable things uh, some of them may be teaching. Now God wants believers to dwell together in unity, but beyond that it isn't a good thing. Zechariah fourteen seventeen, And it shall be that whoso will not come up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, even upon them shall be no rain. So, so I use this verse a lot. It's referring to the millennium when Jesus Christ is sitting on the throne. If the nations don't come up to worship the Lord, then they aren't going to get rain for their crops. Now one more. Zechariah fourteen eighteen. If the family of Egypt go not up and come not, and have no rain, there shall be the plague, wherewith the Lord will smite the heathen that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. So Jesus Christ will be perfect ruler with absolute authority. What he says will go, and no one can vote in or vote out his decision.